The Garden of Eden was the first schoolroom. Nature was the first school book. Adam and Eve were the first students and God himself was the first teacher. And it is our hope that as we go through these lessons week to week, you are brought into a closer and deeper understanding of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is Sabbath School in Eden and welcome to lesson seven of our quarterly this study. Um, we are going to start off with a word of prayer before we go any far. I'm joined by my brother Samvani. Thank you for joining me today. I hope to have you again over and over soon. Shall we bow our heads and pray? Our Father in heaven, thank you, God, for giving us this opportunity to study your word. I thank you for our viewers who have joined us again today. Lord, open our hearts and open our minds so that we may be able to understand what we are learning wholeheartedly and apply it in our lives. I pray this in your loving name. Amen. Amen. Somebody, welcome. Thank you. So today we are on lesson seven, and the title is Teaching Disciples Part One. Mm -hmm. Um. What's our memory text? Our memory text is coming from Mark 8 and verse 34. Mm -hmm. Should I read it? Mm -hmm. When he had called the people to himself, with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is Mark 8 verse 34. So the first half of Mark focuses on who Jesus is. His powerful teaching and miracles point in the same direction. He is the Messiah. At this crucial turning point in the narrative, Jesus will ask the disciples who they believe him to be. Peter gives a clarion answer to that question, and Jesus explains where his steps as Messiah are headed, which is the cross. So we learn in the book of Mark, Jesus is continuously telling his disciples um, mm -hmm. what they're doing, what the steps are, and where he will eventually end up. Yes. I think that's pretty much our introduction on Sabbath afternoon. Do you have any thoughts on the introduction? Yes, um, I'm just liking how the book of Mark was was, was designed, let me say designed. Mm -hmm. uh, to an extent that, like you said, on the first eight chapters, actually Jesus Christ was showing them who they who who he is actually. Mm -hmm. You know, and now he had come to a point where he needs to make a transition. And then going through the lesson, just to preempt it. I mean, I'm just saying that it really shows that there's a designer of these things because the way it, tra it, it, it translates to, to the next part. Can't be actually, a coincidence. Can, it, can, it can be a coincidence. It's actually amazing. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I was just looking at the transition on, or, on, on how it translates from, from the first part to the second part. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, we can all agree that God is the master designer mm -hmm. and is the master planner of everything. Nothing happens by chance. No, no, by chance. Okay, we'll, we'll move on to Sunday. That is entitled Seeing Clearly. So if we read Mark chapter 8, verse 22 to 30, um, it's about the story of a blind man that he had to heal. Mm -hmm. So the long and short of Sunday is that we're talking about why Jesus took two touches to heal this man and not one. Yeah. Because it's not like he failed the first time. It's not like he ever needed to speak twice or touch them twice. He just always did it one time. Mm -hmm. So what's your takeaway on Sunday? Yeah, um, you see... To the comment that I was uh, to the point that I was making, I was alluding to earlier on to say it actually shows that there's a design of these things. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Jesus Christ wants wants to translate to, to he wants to start uh, teaching the disciples exactly how they should continue when he goes. You see, down the lesson how a disciple is actually an, an agent of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. well, I think you see, when I see it on Wednesday or somewhere there. Mm -hmm. Now, Jesus wants to make this transition. He's making sure to say he wants to know if they're on board. So he's, he, 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 I just love how th this thing came about. When I was going through the lesson, it actually, for me, it actually showed me something that I've never seen before. Because I'm seeing that, how is it that, I know, I know he's God, he knows how, what, what he's doing, but then how is it that he actually knew to make this kind of transition mm -hmm. and make this kind of miracle mm -hmm. and to heal this man on this particular time in that journey, you know? Mm -hmm. so, 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 so Jesus Christ is healing this man uh, I wish I had gone through the, 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 the script, but it's fine. Mm -hmm. Where now the man is asking for Jesus to say, can you hear me? Can you hear me? So Jesus is, 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 is sympathizing, sympathizing with him. Mm -hmm. And actually takes him by the hand, says walks out of town. Okay, maybe let me read the, the verses. It's not a long okay. read. Yeah. Um, from verse um, chapter 8, verse 22. Mm -hmm. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. Yeah. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. Yes. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked if he saw aught. 
And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. Mm -hmm. After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. Mm -hmm. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house saying, Neither go into the town nor tell it to any in the town. Mm -hmm. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. Mm -hmm. And by the way, he asked his disciples saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? Mm -hmm. And they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, and others one of the prophets. Mm -hmm. And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Mm -hmm. And Peter answered and said unto him, Thou art the Christ. Mm -hmm. And he charged them that they should tell no men of him. Thank you for that reading. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the point that I was making to say. He knows where they are in, this, in, uh, in, in their point of folk, you mm -hmm. know. Now he heals a man, you know, mm -hmm. with two touches. Mm -hmm. And then Luke says that this is only a parable that Jesus Christ do such kind of miracle where he does like two touches like you're asking me. Mm -hmm. So, so, so it, it shows that sometimes something may not come out clearly if you, if you tell someone once. Mm -hmm. So so he's actually illustrating what the disciples are going through. Mm -hmm. So he touches, he touches the blind man and then asking, what do you see? He says, I see men like trees. Then he does it again. Mm -hmm. And then he sees clearly now, mm -hmm. you know? Now, it's the same thing that the disciples are going through. He says, who do people say that I am? Mm -hmm. You know, it has been a journey. Now the disciples, they, they have been learning about what, what Jesus Christ is teaching them, mm -hmm. you know? So they're but, not hearing him. But they're not hearing him. It is as if Jesus is not clear enough. But mm -hmm. he is clear enough. Mm -hmm. But them have their thoughts elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So Jesus Christ is trying to unfold this thing for them, mm -hmm. like in two touches. He mm -hmm. says, guys, who do you say that I am? Mm -hmm. He says, until this point in time, he had never asked them this question. Mm -hmm. He says, no, you are the Messiah. But still, even though he says that you're Messiah, they still don't understand exactly what his Messiah, Messiah is about. So he, that's where the two touches come in. That's what I'm saying that it is interesting to say that Jesus Christ is healing the man, mm -hmm. yes, but at the same time, we might also say that he's healing the disciples with the same two touches so that they can seek healing. So, so the two touches have nothing to do with Jesus, but everything to do with the disciples. With the disciples, mm -hmm. yes. So it, does, so it says here also just to note that Jesus taking the man by the hand and mm -hmm. leading him out of the village by his hands, mm -hmm. one can sense his sympathy for the man's disability. Yeah. So it, I think for me, it speaks to how tender Jesus is mm. when he's opening our eyes and helping us and guiding us on the path over mm. and over with the same thing and we're not understanding, yeah. but he remains sympathetic. So yeah. like, like you're saying that the disciples needed to be told over and over. Mm. So the two touches were for them. The two touches was for the man and not a reflection of Jesus and mm. his power. No, 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 not of Jesus. Mm. Yeah, and another thing that I liked on the day on Sunday is how, you see, Peter says that you are the Christ. Uh -huh. You're the Messiah, you're the Christ. And then interestingly, Jesus Christ is saying, he's saying that, don't tell this to anyone. Mm -hmm. Then I'm wondering to say, okay, I thought you're the Messiah, we need to know that you're the Messiah, and then we need to tell everyone about it. Mm -hmm. But it's just interesting to say, Jesus Christ is saying that, don't say this to anyone as of yet. Mm -hmm. You know? And then I was looking to it to say, why was the case that Jesus Christ was saying, don't. But then I understood to say, the disciples, like we're saying, that they didn't, really, they didn't fully understand what Messiah is about. Mm -hmm. And then I understand that it also had uh, some political overtone mm -hmm. on the messiahship of Jesus Christ because they had expected that the messiah was going to come and overturn the Roman, uh, the Roman rule and everything, which case Jesus Christ didn't come to do that. Yeah. So because they were, because their side wasn't clear, mm -hmm. he says, you know what, I'm the messiah, yes, but don't go out and preach about my messiahship. Because you knew what, what that meant. Yes, because you knew that you're going to preach a wrong message, actually. Yeah. yeah Poli so, politically, they would have already assumed yeah, that's what he was there to yeah. do. Yeah. So for me, it made sense to say, okay, this is the reason why Jesus Christ said that don't go out and talk about my messiahship yet mm -hmm. up until you come to a point in time where you know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think something also that's interesting that we learn about here is that it says Peter is the first person not demon-possessed who yeah. declares Jesus is the messiah. Yeah. Yeah. So that's something I'd never realized that only the demon possessed people and the demons themselves yeah. call Jesus the Messiah. <laughs> Shall we move on? Yeah, to we can go, we can go on Monday. On Monday, yeah, that's okay. okay. Monday is entitled The Cost of Discipleship. Mm -hmm. So it says here that um, the disciples have come to a crucial turning point in their relationship with Jesus. They now know that he is the Messiah. Mm -hmm. The reader of Mark has known this from the beginning of the book and thus has had an advantage sometimes over the bumbling disciples. So Mark chapter 1 verse 1 says, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mm 
So we are told immediately yeah. as soon as we start the book of Mark. Okay. Yeah. What are your thoughts on Monday? On Monday, uh, we are uh, talking about the cost of the servership. Uh-huh. Yeah, this one has a lot to say on this, eh? Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, but briefly, it's interesting how Jesus Christ, you know how um, Peter, mm-hmm. Jesus Christ is, is, is telling them the second part of his ministry. He says, guys, mm-hmm. I'm the Messiah, but I'm supposed to die on the cross. Mm-hmm. Now, the disciples don't understand what he's saying. And then he's rebuking them. That he's rebuking Jesus. Say, why are you saying you're going to die? You why see, are you saying things like that? Why are you saying things like that? Because these are things that these are things that they didn't want to hear. They wanted to hear nice things like we're going to take over the government. We're going to be the the ruler of this government and all those. Mm-hmm. So it is as if they are telling. It is as if Jesus Christ is saying something that they didn't expect him to mm-hmm. say. Now he's saying, though, no, my what I'm teaching you here to be disciples. It's not just about ethical things. It's not just about getting things right away. Mm-hmm. It's not just about getting the benefits right away. You know, so he's telling them the cost of it. He says, no, I actually have to go through death. And then the big shock, death, you're going to die. Mm-hmm. So he's telling them, I, the actual cost of all these things, that I came from heaven to actually die on the cross so that I can, so that I can, save, your sin, I can save you from your sins. Mm-hmm. And then he continues to say, take your cross and follow me. Mm-hmm. Like you're, you're being my disciples. I'm teaching you how to do it. Mm-hmm. So that when I go, you should do the same things. Now you can see that that cost is not it's not a small cost. Mm-hmm. It's like a great cost. Yeah. For a great value also. Yeah. So I just I just liked how it was summarized like that. Because the cross in itself, you know, it was something that the death of the cross, it was a capital a capital punishment by the Roman government Roman government. Eh? Mm-hmm. It was it was it was it was very humiliating. Mm-hmm. Embarrassing. Embarrassing. It was cruci- crucifixion in Roman times is something that it's going to be embarrassing. Just so for a proper criminal. Yeah, a proper criminal. Now Jesus Christ is now being assigned to that. Mm-hmm. But now, now, now that now that we're saying this, I'm also thinking to say that God knew what He was doing, mm-hmm. you know. And even through this thing, He knows what He was doing to say that the cost to save us from sin is not is not cheap, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. You'd have come and died in any other any other death, but then they chose that He dies mm-hmm. just to show the cost of it. Say, you know what? This thing is not easy. It's not simple. Yeah. But you know, at the beginning, when the disciples were first called, they were never told about the trouble that was coming. No, really they thought it right. would be smooth sailing. Yes. So only now, you can imagine the shock now when they're being told that yeah. whoever wants to follow um, Jesus must have the same goal. Take yeah. up the cross and follow him. Mm-hmm. So why would anyone carry a cross as a symbol of devotion to Jesus? That's a lot. You look, look at, look at the, the quote that I found from Jim Elliot. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep. To mm-hmm. gain that which he, he cannot can... lose, mm-hmm. you know. So it's, it's like a paradox to say you do the other to gain the other. Yeah. So so it's the same thing with that, with that cost of being a disciple. It's not just about us receiving from from the silver platter, you know. Mm-hmm. But it's something where, where where we have to show like our commitment also. So the cost of being a disciple is actually a great cost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, John chapter twelve verse twenty five also says, "He who loves his life will lose it." Yeah. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's pretty much it on Monday, right? I agree. Okay, let's move on to Tuesday. Tuesday is entitled The Mountain and the Multitude. Mm -hmm. So in Mark chapter 9, verse 1, let me read Mark chapter 9, verse 1. It says, um, And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. So Jesus predicted in Mark chapter 9 verse 1 that some standing with him would not taste death before seeing the kingdom of God come. Mm-hmm. So that prediction is fulfilled within a few days when he takes Peter, James, and John up a high mountain alone. Mm-hmm. There he's transfigured before them into the glory of the heavenly kingdom. So this is when Elijah and Moses appeared mm-hmm. and conversed with Jesus. Mm-hmm. So what are your thoughts on Tuesday? Yeah, Tuesday also... Actually, this lesson has got deep. This lesson deep has got undertones. Deep. Yeah. Yeah, deep undertones. You know how it is. Um, yeah, I, 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 I wish you could get the the verbatim of the conversation that Jesus had, yeah. had with with Elijah and Moses. You know, we're not told what exactly they discussed, right? Yeah. But, but the disciples beheld them discussing something. <laughs> but we know that they were talking about Jesus' Jesus's departure. departure. Mm-hmm. But elsewhere, it also talks about that. They were more like strengthening Jesus Christ to say, you're about to go through this, the mission that you actually came here for, mm-hmm. the cross. 
you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't want to go deep into it, but now you see that these people who are here, Moses and Elijah, represent a group of people who one died and resurrected, Moses, mm-hmm. and then Elijah didn't test death. God, he went to heaven like that. Mm-hmm. So, so these people are already in heaven right, right now as we know it. Mm-hmm. So they come here and then strengthen Jesus to say, you know what, we're in heaven by the grace of God. Mm-hmm. And then it is, it is actually your death, you know, on the cross that gives us that access to heaven. Yeah. You know? so, so there's a, a lot of talk that is happening, uh, that is happening right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm, I'm saying I wish we had the verbatim conversation uh, uh, about what these guys were talking about. Mm-hmm. But look, like you're saying to say, Jesus Christ had promised the disciples to say, some of you guys standing here, won't die up until you see something happening. Mm-hmm. And now this was a major thing happening. I don't know how I was going to respond or react if I see Elijah and Moses. <laughs> you know? And then it says that the disciples didn't, did not know what to do. All they said was like, Master, should we put a tent here? They said it was just a very good experience. You know? They just wanted to stay there now forever. To remember it forever. <laughs> yeah, but now there's, there's, a, there's a few other... Um, but also, okay, before we move on from the part about Elijah yeah. and Moses, yeah. I just also find it interesting that the disciples knew that that was Elijah and Moses. Because okay. it's not like Jesus, we're not, okay, we're not told that yeah, when how, they came, how, yeah. Jesus was turned yeah. around and was like, oh, hi, yeah. uh, my disciples <laughs> meet Elijah and Moses. We don't yeah, know how it happened, yeah, yeah. but how would, how did they immediately know? No, because they'd never seen Moses Elijah, before, yeah. you know? So I also have always find that interesting. Yeah. Okay, no, 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 I, have ne- I never thought about it that mm. way, you know? Now that he's saying it actually makes sense. Or did sense they talk it. among themselves to say, that must be Elijah or that must be Moses? Or did Jesus actually... These are things maybe yeah, we'll ask when we get that, to heaven. Yeah, 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 and yeah. ask, how did the conversation go? How did you guys know that <laughs> that, that was, was Elijah and Moses? Or did Jesus introduce yeah, that is, you guys to them? Yeah, and another thing that, that, that didn't tell us is how long it lasted. Eh? Mm-hmm. They never told us exactly was how it five long. Minutes, five was minutes? Was it 30 minutes? Was, was it an hour? hour? You know? <laughs> <laughs> but it must have been... In any case, it must have been a very nice... Experience, experience yeah. being there. And did you notice that Jesus Christ only took three disciples up there? Yeah. Some people call them, he says that his favorite disciples. I don't know why, but I think it's the same thing in any classroom. Uh-huh. I think you have your favorite uh, uh, students. So it, t- it takes Peter, James, and John. Uh-huh. And then the other disciples, just like us, just hear about the experience, but they were never here. <laughs> Okay, I think I'm going... Uh, <laughs> no, but I them. get you. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, also interesting. But there's also things we'll ask when we get to hear them. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say exactly what I mean. But I wanted to... I want, I want, there was something that I wanted to share with you on the same uh, before I lose... Um, before before I, I miss the point. To say that... Um, uh, what, what did you want to say on this point? That the disciples, they had this, this, uh, uh, this condition about... The, uh, the appearance of, of, of Elijah before the great day of the Lord. Mm-hmm. You know, so they did not understand exactly what did what that, that mean. You know? uh. So when they saw now Elijah, it's when they're asking Jesus to say, was this, was this the fulfilling of, the, of, the, of that prophecy? Mm-hmm. Say, is this the Elijah that we're waiting for? Mm-hmm. He says, actually, no. The work of the Elijah is not this one. It's the one that came with uh, John the Baptist, even mm-hmm. though most people did not believe. But that was, the, that was the work of the Elijah that came to prepare the word. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm saying that John the Baptist was actually Elijah in, 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 his, in his ministry. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what that, so that what you're referring to is Malachi 4, verse 5 and 6. Yes, exactly. So then that says, mm-hmm. um, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before mm-hmm. the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Yeah. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children mm-hmm. and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so another thing we come across here on Tuesday is. Mm-hmm. Um, the child who was demon possessed. Yeah. Yeah. So it says here that Jesus seems to take a long time inquiring about the details of the demon possession. Mm-hmm. And then it was too much for the father, and he blurted out, If you can do anything, mm-hmm. have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus immediately picked up on the expression of doubt. Okay. You know, the mm-hmm. Lord's words, um, the, the, the Lord's response can be paraphrased. What do you mean, if you can, Mm -hmm. long and short of it? (laughs) Suddenly, like a bolt of lightning from the sky, Mm -hmm. the father sees that it is not only his son who has a problem, he also has a problem of unbelief. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, Then I wanted to make a comment earlier on. Remember how I was saying that as disciples, we are agents of Jesus Christ. As disciples, we are agents of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Should I I put it that way? Mm -hmm. But we we are in the same company, you know? We represent Jesus Christ on earth. That's what I'm trying to say. So, so look at look at look at what is happening here. Jesus Christ is coming with these three uh, 
favorite disciples from the mount. Mm -hmm. I believe, I, I, maybe, maybe I'll be assuming things, but I, I, stand, I stand to be collected to say that Jesus says was still, remember when he transfigured, he changed his appearance. Mm -hmm. He looked brighter. Mm -hmm. Heavenly glory. Heavenly glory. I'm thinking that when he came from the mountain, I think he the glory had still looking it. like that. Yeah, but not exactly though, but, but I think I the think glory so was too. still. I think so too. I think he must have been. Just like when Moses came back um, from getting the Ten yeah, Commandments. Yeah. When he came down, he was still, we you still, know, still, there I, to cover him. Yeah. So I'm just thinking that, but I'm saying I'm, I stand to be corrected yeah. if he was. But I'm just thinking that to some extent maybe he was still a little bit shiny. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me not dwell on that point. Shiny. Always so <laughs> <laughs> shiny. Okay, let me not dwell on that point so much. Oh, bright. This point. Oh, bright. Let me say bright. But I'm saying now, it comes. Actually, when I was going through the lesson, I wanted to bring this to your attention to say, how did Jesus Christ know how to know where? How did he know where his disciples were? You know, mm -hmm. they didn't have WhatsApp this time. They didn't have phones. You know, I don't know how did he how did he find his disciples? Did but he they, was Jesus. Did, did, did they know where to meet them? But but what you know is there, there were there was a cloud somewhere. Mm -hmm. and something was happening. Mm -hmm. So it goes down there, and you see what the father the boy the father of the boy says. Mm -hmm. He says, "You are." I he says I brought my, my, my son to your disciples, mm -hmm. and they failed to heal him. You know. So actually no actually I should say that I have brought my, my, my son to you, not just, not not your disciples. He says, I actually brought my, my son to you mm -hmm. and you have failed to heal him, you know? Mm -hmm. now, this is the point that I wanted to dwell in on. To say, when the father of the boy took the boy to the disciples, to him, it was, as, it was almost as good as taking to, the, to, to, to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Because he knew that these people were together. They walk with Jesus. They walk with Jesus. And remember, and remember the disciples, uh, uh, to this extent, to this time, I think they must have been sent before and, and he would, you know? Actually, mm -hmm. they, were, they were healing people. Mm -hmm. But now, you see, the Bible is, is, very, com is a very complex book. Mm -hmm. I believe that the disciples were actually healing people, even when Jesus was not there. Yeah. So it says, we brought, this, we brought my son to you, but you have failed. Mm -hmm. That's why he is now saying, if you can, do this. So when, when the father said that to Jesus, yeah. Jesus answered him and said, O oh, faithless generation, how mm -hmm. long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. Yeah. Who is he talking to there? Is he talking to the disciples or to the father of the child? I think for me, both. I think for me both because the disciples have failed, mm -hmm. but also the other reason why, why, why they have failed might, also, might have also been because the father had um, showed some, showed some disbelief. disbelief. Yeah. said, you know what, if you believe everything is possible, mm -hmm. then he confesses and say, help my, my, help my belief, let mm -hmm. me believe. Then mm -hmm. as moment, the moment he does that, it's when Jesus Christ performs a miracle, mm -hmm. and then the boy is healed. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think both the disciples, and then, and you see, down the story, the disciples actually asked Jesus to say, this kind, what was it? Mm -hmm. Then he says that this kind can only come out with nothing but by prayer and fasting. So I would think that disciples, the disciples had, had also to do with the failure of the deliverance of the boy, yeah. as much as the father did. Mm -hmm. True. Mm -hmm. So the father did not believe. But mm -hmm. when he admitted his unbelief and asked for Jesus to help his unbelief, mm -hmm. that's an admission of you know, reliance and asking for help, and Jesus yeah. heals the boy. Yeah. But then as, as we read further down, mm -hmm. um, it says of 28 and 29, and when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast him out? Mm -hmm. And he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing, but by prayer and fasting. Yeah. So the disciples needed to pray and fast. Yeah. So, so for sure he was talking to the disciples, but also to the father, to that's the father. what I think. Yeah, I would agree. I would think both of them had. Had got it wrong. Yeah. yeah. So I think my takeaway from Tuesday is pretty mm -hmm. much that Jesus must help our unbelief. Mm -hmm. Because all of us have doubts and mm -hmm. questions. And, you know, we approach Jesus for things. But then we then go and limit him and say, if you can. Mm -hmm. If you can, you know. Yeah. And Jesus can sense our doubt. And then when nothing happens, then we say Jesus. But it's actually us. So we also need to say to God, mm -hmm. help our unbelief. Yeah. It's interesting. It's funny how the, 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 the lesson writer, for us to say Jesus is saying that, why do you mean if I can? Yeah. Do you know me? You know, like, like do you know who I, who I am? I can do anything that I want. Yeah. But it's about you, not me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it was really about the unbelief. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're done with Tuesday as well, right? Yeah. Um. So at this point, we're going to take a short break. Um. And I ask our viewers to please stay with us and see you just now. Remember to like, comment, share, subscribe, so that we may all come together, have a discussion, engage with us in our comment section. Um, and we will see you just now after the break. Thank you for being part of our Sabbath School community. We invite you to continue watching and exploring our study together. 
to access more of our enriching lessons and dive deeper into the teachings, simply download the adult Sabbath school lessons at www.ssnet.org. Sharing this link can make a difference and potentially save a life. Join us in this journey of spiritual growth and discovery. Thank you for being part of our Sabbath school family. everyone and welcome back we are now going into wednesday and that is entitled who is the greatest so um could you take us through the story about this whole thing around who the greatest is was it jesus asking the disciples or is it the disciples asking jesus who the greatest is mm. what's what what's the story yeah the story is on actually got it in march 9 verse 33 mm -hmm. it says then they came to Capernaum, mm -hmm. and when he was in the house he asked them what was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? Uh -huh. Yeah, so the, the backdrop of the story is that when they're going back to Capernaum, they, they didn't travel together. So they tra the disciples tra traveled on, the, on their own and then they got where, where they were going. Like I said, they didn't have WhatsApp, but, but maybe they would have. <laughs> told Jesus other. found them. Yeah, I said, okay, we're gonna meet at this house, you know? So they made wherever they were gonna meet, whether it was their home, you know, some things are implied in the Bible, like. Whose home was it? Was it their usual meeting place? Yeah. But anyway, you go. You guess there She's anyway. Their spot. Yeah, you guess there at the spot anyway. And am I assuming that they're eating or what? So he asked him, say, guys, as you're coming here, I heard you discussing about who's, who's the greatest. Mm -hmm. But Jesus says it is. It is interesting to note that Jesus says was not there. Mm -hmm. But with being with being, him being God, he kind of had the conversation miles away, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I heard you discussing about, oh, you're not discussing about Asher, but actually, I heard you talking about who's the greatest. And no one said anything. And no one said anything. It's, it's like they were caught or something. Again. Uh -huh. Like they were caught of cat. It's like, okay, you heard us? And you were fighting about this thing? I don't know who, who was Can you imagine it. 12 grown men arguing <laughs> about who the greatest is all the way to wherever they were going? Yeah. So uh, it says here that um, they, it, um, no one speaks up a sure sign of their discomfort at the question. Yeah. Almost like children caught doing something they know is wrong. Yeah. So so it's it's interesting how then it goes on to say, and he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and seventh of all. Mm -hmm. So he's saying to say, Who is the greatest? It's not how you see it. Then he says, Then he took a, a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one of these little children in my name mm -hmm. receives me. And whoever receives me, receives not me, but him who sent me. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I'm, I'm just trying to answer the question to say, who is the greatest, you know? So when Jesus is saying, I heard you guys fight about who is the greatest among you. In their own human uh, wisdom understanding, they wanted to say maybe, Someone, remember how we said that these guys had a wrong understanding of his messiahship? Yeah. So maybe they were fighting to say, who's going to be the chief accountant? Maybe Judas. Who's going to be like our leader or something like that? So he says, no, 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 no. This thing is not about that. This heavenly thing yeah. is really not about that. It's about service. Uh -huh. So he's saying, who wants to be the greatest is going to be the one who's going to serve the most. Uh -huh. Then it's actually the, it's like, it's like the, the now show the fact again to say, oh, it's about service. It's about like being a, yeah. a small children. It's a small child and all mm -hmm. that thing. So it's just interesting to note how Jesus Christ would always bring a certain uh, a, a, an aspect of things differently from how they would, they would have thought otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it says here that the Lord affirms that helping those in Christian service, mm -hmm. even in small ways, yeah. does not go unnoticed in heaven. Yeah. So basically, to be the greatest, you need to be the the most humble. You need to be a servant to the people. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the long and short of Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. I would agree. It's about how Jesus completely flipped their idea of mm. what being great means. Great, great about. In the kingdom of God, that whole idea gets mm -hmm. turned upside down. Yeah. But also the fact that they were being quiet mm. and you know not actually it means they know that what they were thinking mm -hmm. is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um going moving on to Thursday mm -hmm. now. It says the healthy man in hell. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting title. Very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so I think what I came across here was yeah. um about how it says here that the catchphrase causes to sin mm -hmm. leads to the longest teaching in a passage in the Bible. It says, Jesus, is Jesus really teaching people to cut off a hand yeah. or foot or pluck out an eye? 
Secondly, is he teaching an eternally burning hell? The answer to the first question is no. Jesus is not teaching mutilation. Mm -hmm. That was rejected in Judaism. Mm -hmm. The Lord is using hyperbole to make his point. If losing a hand, foot, or eye is terrible, how much more disaster should it be for the Christian to sin? So the title comes from saying, if... Um, cutting off my hand because it's causing me to sin or my foot or plucking out my eye mm -hmm. means that the, we can if we consider the people who are going to heaven, right? Mm -hmm. With one eye, one foot or one hand. And then we consider the people that are going to hell. They're going fully um, with all their body parts intact. Yeah. So should it not be the other way around? Mm -hmm. The healthy men in hell? That is comedic. Such comedy over a serious topic leads one to consider that Jesus is illustrating a point with hyperbole. Sin should not be taken so seriously that it sin should be mm -hmm. taken so seriously that it would be better to lose a hand, mm -hmm. foot, or eye than to sin. Yeah. So it's not like a real life situation mm -hmm. lest we go around plucking, plucking our eyes out yeah yeah no um i i, I actually agree on, on that part where no you actually you actually said it very well let me not add more on the same but i would rather want to comment on the second part mm -hmm. of the of the of the of the question because it, of the of the of the lesson there because it talks about uh yeah here it talks about the way the way mark 9 42 to 48 um, it has, it, the way he portrays it, mm -hmm. it shows as if he's talking about, he's, Jesus Christ is saying that the person, if people are going to hell, they're going to bend forever, mm -hmm. you know. So I wanted to make a comment on that to say, uh, to understand the Bible, you need to read so many other parts. You just can't read one passage and then make a conclusion out of it. Yeah. So so it doesn't really mean that we're here, or let me say, for example, let me, okay, let me read, you know, you know what, read for us um, 42 to 44. Mark chapter 9. Yeah. Um, verse 42 says, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, mm -hmm. it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and mm -hmm. he were cast into the sea. Mm -hmm. And if thy hand offended thee, mm -hmm. cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed mm -hmm. than having two hands to go into hell, mm -hmm. into the fire that never shall be quenched. Mm -hmm. Where their worm dieth not mm -hmm. and the fire is not quenched. Yes, I wanted that part. Because it it it's... It paints a picture as if of the, the people, fire that will never be quenched. Yeah, that they go to hell, to go to hell, and then the fire will never be quenched, uh -huh. and their worm does not die, and the fire is not quenched. Like like uh, the fire shall never be quenched. Uh -huh. So so it paints a, it paints a, a picture that we can conclude to say hell is going to burn forever. But I'm saying that's not true mm -hmm. because because if you look at what the Book of Revelation also teaches, mm -hmm. it says that burn hell will not burn forever. Uh -huh. Actually, it says that hell is going to be the same earth being cleansed. So it's going to bend to some to some extent, mm -hmm. and then it's going to be recreated into a new place. Mm -hmm. So 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 this connotation here is just a figure of speech to say the fire is going to bend up until it accomplishes what it wants to accomplish, mm -hmm. and no one can quench it up until it finishes mm -hmm. its its purpose. You know. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to, to zero down to zero down on the same point to say no one can quench it, but it will then. You know you know when I light up let's say. And God forbid, this is a Bible, but if it is just any other book, mm -hmm. if I light it up to bend this book, if it was another book, not mm -hmm. the Bible, to bend this book, that fire that I'm going to light is only going to stop when it finishes bending this Bible. When it's quenched. When, when it's when on the, quench on itself. When the, when the, when the Bible is finished. When the, when the Bible is finished. Uh -huh. So that's how the fire is going to stop. Uh -huh. But up until the Bible, up, up until the book around the Bible, up until the book is not finished, then the fire is going to burn up until uh -huh. it finishes. So it's the same condition here. So I, eventually the hell fire is going to die down uh -huh. and then God is going to create the whole world again and then we will continue with life as, it, as, as, in, as in the Bible says it in heaven. It says here that as to hell being eternal, mm -hmm. it's the consequences that are eternal, not yeah. the fire of hell itself. No. Yeah. So for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Mm -hmm. So emphasis, um, so those who are lost do not burn forever. No. Instead, they perish forever. They perish forever. That's a very big difference. And that's a very big difference. Yeah. I think it was important for us to discuss that because growing up, mm. we've always been told that you're going to burn forever. Yeah, it has, it has, it has, yeah. it has been and a you know, wrong like, understanding of it. And, and, and being a child or mm. not reading for yourself mm -hmm. and stuff, yeah. I would always think, can you imagine burning forever? Because we'd be told that you will burn forever mm. and while you're not burning. So yes. you're burning forever, but not burning, See, and but you're feeling like you're burning, you're burning but you're forever. forever. 
So, like a god that bends someone forever. Exactly. Actually, actually, there's a story here about Sodom and Gomorrah where the Bible also talks about that it was burnt forever. Mm-hmm. But we know that the fire died. Yeah. So it's something like a consequence that whatever bent, bent to the ground. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's the consequence. It's the con- consequence it's the, it's that lasts forever. Yeah. Um. Okay. So we have reached the end of our lesson. Do you have any takeaways? Anything that stood out for you in this lesson? Yeah. Um. So many, but um, I think time is not against, is, is against us. So I, 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 I just wanted to make to to zero down on what you had said already on on this healthy man on Thursday, healthy man in hell. That Jesus Christ is actually saying that you know what you'd rather go to heaven. Uh, Meme, meme. Mm-hmm. Without, your hand, without, without your hand, without a hand. foot. Okay, the, 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 there's, there's, um, yeah, then, then go to hell. So, so, so he's saying you'd rather go to heaven blind mm-hmm. with one eye. So for me, for me, that 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 made that made that made that, made, that showed me the gravity of sin. To say you know what, even if it means to cut your your arm. If it causes you to sin, mm-hmm. then do it just so you can go to heaven. That's how serious sin is. So that's how serious sin is. So in other ways, saying that you're not guys, make By it a point any that means necessary. Don't sin. Yeah. That was my one of my take, take on points. I think that stood out for me as well because I don't think I think we underestimate sin. Yeah. We don't take it as seriously as we should. No. Um, what stood out for me was the part about the disciples arguing about who is the greatest and yeah, stuff. Yeah. There's a quotation here that stood out for me as well um, mm-hmm. on Friday. It says, mm-hmm. before honor is humility. Mm-hmm. To fill a high place before men, heaven chooses the worker who, like John the Baptist, takes a lowly place before God. Mm-hmm. The most childlike disciple is the most efficient in labor for God. Mm-hmm. The heavenly intelligences can cooperate with him who is seeking not to exalt self, but to save souls. Yeah, for True. me, that, that, that's what stood out. Um, that before honor is humility, mm-hmm. and we should be as humble as Jesus was. Jesus was actually the greatest, yeah. and yet he was the most humble. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So thank you to our viewers at home for joining us for this lesson. Thank you, Brother Sambani. Mm-hmm. It's been very eye-opening having this discussion with you, and I hope you can come again and join us soon. Mm-hmm. Thank you to our viewers at home for joining us. Please remember to like comment, share, subscribe so that we may spread this message far and wide so that we can all make it to heaven and live happily ever after. We will see you next week for lesson eight. Stay blessed.